Hey everyone, Curse Deck Builder here, making our way to 10,000 decks assisted, and right now we're looking at Elmar and Wernog, Friends Forever Game Objects. Before we go on a little administration, uh, you know, I've been saying that I'm going to be on a stream tonight, and I talk to them, and turns out we're just recording. Turns out I'm a little foolish and I should have checked all the information first. So there's no stream to tune, tune into, but hopefully when the video is up, I will make sure you all know so you can check it out and probably watch me lose some games of Commander. <laughs> uh, but on the future side, maybe I will look into doing some streams myself. Uh, but as always, this kind of stuff is going to wait until after my wedding, which is coming up. Uh, so. Hopefully we can plan some fun things into the future. As for this deck, uh, this deck comes to us from Chronically Ill MTG. Uh, they say what they're looking for is maybe more game enders. I avoid combos though. Not sure on Signets versus Talismans, mainly need help with cuts. Would really like another set of eyes and maybe get a different opinion. Overall, I'm very proud of the deck so far and it's an absolute blast to play. And that they have uh, they say, I try not to spend more than $10 per card most of the time in terms of budget. We can definitely look at the deck, uh, see what we can cut, and also see some additions. Try to keep it in theme and keep it in budget. But while we're here, this is a great time to remind you guys that if you would like your own commander deck uh, to have a video made and for me to assist you, there's a link in the video description down below that you can fill out a form and send your deck to me. And if you would like your deck to be the next deck I work on, there is a link to that there as well. Finally, if you'd like to take a look at this Elmar Wernog deck, uh, you know, yourself or during the video, there is a link to the deck list in the video description. So before we get any further, let's get a general idea of Wernog Elmar or Elmar Wernog, because they are one of our friends forever commander pairs. Now, the Friends Forevers, I believe, are all from um, Stranger Things, I believe it is. But they've uh, gotten their in-universe versions, which is a bunch of characters from Innistrad who uh, are Friends Forever, which is really cute. I do really like that. So, each of them kind of do a different thing, but they generally have to do with clue tokens. Uh, I played Wernog and the Red White Lady, uh, so this is a little different. We're adding another color here, so we're getting green. So starting with Wernog. Wernog is a 2-mana 1-2 uh, legendary human in black and white. And, it sa and he says whenever he enters or leaves the battlefield, each opponent may investigate. Each opponent who doesn't loses one life. And then you investigate X times, which is one for yourself and one additional time for each opponent who investigated. That's a lot to take in. Uh, just put simply, when it comes in, everyone gets to investigate. You always investigate, and then everyone else has a choice. If they don't, they lose a life, and if they do, you investigate an additional time. So here's the thing about Wernog. I really, really like Wernog. I think he's a very, very fun creature and does a lot of really cool things. The only downside is that he... People tend to say no a lot. This is an option, and uh, when, when they say no, he becomes Thraben Inspector, but a little worse. Well, not a little worse, a little better, let's say. Because uh, it's double the mana, but you also gain a clue token when he leaves play, and does a total of six damage, three in, three out. And that's not terrible, but it's not super impressive. This is one of those partner commanders that's supposed to be, you know, the combined efforts of both of your commanders is worth one single com commander, but individually they're not too great. But that being said, I really do like Wernog. He's low mana, so you always have a turn to play. He also always guarantees, you know, an unearthed uh, target or a blink target, which are both really, really nice. On the other hand, we have Elmar, who is our gruel side. That's red, green, three mana, three, two, haste. And his, he's much more simple. He says, whenever you cast your second spell each turn, untap target creature, then investigate. Now, we generally like the investigation part of this a little more, 
but the untapping target creature will work with certain creatures that have really good tapping abilities or tap for quite a bit of mana. So the idea of combining these two is that we're creating clue tokens. Now, let's take a look at the deck itself, because just like any version of these partner decks, we do have a lot of variants. And it seems like Chronically Ill MTG has gone out of their way to build a very much so game objects deck. We're looking for token artifacts, and we're looking for every single way we can make them. Even some that I think are a little weaker than others. If we look at the curve, the curve is really, really nice. Starting at 9, we can see both Blasphemous Act and the Great Henge are reduced in power. At 8, Vanquish the Horde is reduced in power. And at 7, we actually have spells to cast. So the curve kind of ends at 7. Around 5, uh, we kind of teeter off. Um, almost no cards here. And at 4, we've got the last few real cards. So this is the kind of deck... I, I know a lot of people who like this kind of deck, me included. Um, which is, how do I put this lightly? It's kind of complicated. You are adding in a lot of advantages to yourself, but the advantages themselves aren't like major ad advantages. Like for example, uh, we can see that Smothering Tithe is a card that we all understand that once we play Smothering Tithe, we are getting ahead. And we're getting ahead almost immediately and in a very visible way. Either we're burning through our opponent's mana, or we are getting mana ourselves to use on our turns. So, very simple way to understand it. Whereas something like playing Elmar, well, the advantage is still there, but it's kind of nebulous, right? You need to first of all, um, you need to first of all go through and start making the clue tokens. After you make the clue tokens, you then need to find time to crack them, right? And this sounds obvious, right? This is how clue tokens work. But it's something that's worth noting because one, Elmar is very good at generating clue tokens. You can get at least, if you think about it, you can get at least one a turn if you're playing correctly. And then those clue tokens draw you back up and then allow you to have more cards to cast two spells. It's a really nice, you know, cyclical kind of thing. But then think about it for a second. Where are you getting the mana to do all of this, right? It's not free to do to crack clue tokens. And there's been a lot of times I've played these kind of decks where you have clue tokens that just kind of sit there. They are advantage. And don't get me wrong, this is getting you further in the game, but they are nebulous advantage. They are advantage when you have time to take advantage, uh, to take like, you know, to capitalize on it and crack a bunch of clues. And that doesn't happen as easily as you think. So uh, I, I know the deck builder knows all of this. I'm just giving a general vibe for anyone who is watching. So with that in mind, this kind of deck, it's like you're building several different engines. And all of these engines work really well together. Elmar comes out every second spell a clue. You put out Lotho, every second spell a treasure as well. Uh, you put Samwise. Now, um, as, as non-creatures enter the battlefield, uh, sorry, non-tokens enter the battlefield, you get food. You know, then we get out Academy Manufacturer, and all of these now create a bunch of stuff, etc., etc. The thing is, is this situation does build up into a critical mass really quickly, but it is also incredibly vulnerable to board wipes, even the non-planar uh, cleansing types, where a lot of our pieces are creatures, and we have to really work around making sure, you know, we're not losing, we're not losing the game if the board is wiped and we've lost all the advantage, and we're left with a few to clue tokens here and there, right? So, all that to say, uh, it's kind of a balancing act in decks like this. So I'm going to point out a few of the cards that I believe are not holding up their weight in the balancing act, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, talismans and uh, signets, and then we'll talk about additions. Let's go backwards, because uh, then we can hit signets and talismans quickly. So looking through our enchantments, I really like them. They're really straightforward. Looking into our artifacts, though, Tempting Contract, very, very cleanly, is a card I don't particularly like. Both because, unlike Wernog, you're never guaranteed to get your treasure, right? 
Uh, this one is completely dependent on your opponents, uh, you know, agreeing to give you treasure. And that means that if your opponents want to, which they will, if they want to lock you out of the four mana you spent on this card, they can look at each other and just say, all right, we never make a treasure token. And when that's happened, you've basically burned through four mana for nothing, right? The thing you might say is, well, Curse, we can try to get situations where our opponents, you know, are in a bad, like, they need to get the treasure tokens. Yeah, but that's not, this This isn't the kind of deck, right? Like, we don't have any land tax, we don't have any, uh, and by that I mean, like, uh, taxation effects on mana or land destruction. We don't have anything to, you know, put our opponents into uh, into stasis or anything like that to force them to start getting those treasures. And I'm also going to suggest that Tempting Contract, despite being nearly identical to Warnog, actually pairs rather bad with Warnog. One of the benefits of Warnog is actually kind of the opposite, like, it's the other side of the coin of something I said earlier about how clue tokens are ne nebulous advantage and are sometimes a little difficult to uh, to crack or to find time to take advantage of. That's actually on your side because some people will uh, create the clue tokens from Warnog and they will never crack it during the entire game. And that's rather good for you because it basically means there was no downside to Warnog. Tempting Contract does not work that way because treasure tokens do not work that way. Uh, and the fact that those treasure tokens then guarantee your opponent has the mana to crack those clue tokens, I don't love it. I like Descend into Aver Avernus so much better because it guarantees the treasure tokens uh, and also it is a win condition of draining your opponents through damage. All right. Uh, let's quickly talk about the Signets versus the Talisman's idea. And the idea of the idea of this is kind of simple. Uh, the downside of Talismans is they only add one of two colors and they cost life. However, they can tap by themselves. Whereas the cost of the Signet is that you need mana to put in and it always generates the same mana, a green and a red. This makes it difficult because... If you have a card with a lot of mana pips, looking at you, ultimatums, uh, the, uh, the signets are really bad at getting that mana. Namely, if there's a lot of pips of the same color. Imagine you're playing, trying to play Necropotence at three black mana, and you have a signet, let's say Rakdos signet, or any signet that creates black, well, you actually cannot cast Necropotence with that which is a little weird, but it is how it is. So with that in mind, I'm generally more on Tal. If I have to pick between them, I pick the Talismans first, which seems to be what you've done, and I tend to agree with that. I would argue you could also put Felwar Stone here, because when you're running four colors, the odds of your Felwar Stone tapping for mana that you want is really high. All right. That's basically it for here. Shadow Spear feels a bit weird here, I will say. Uh, you just don't have what I would consider to be really big creatures most of the time. And the thing in combat in Commander, especially with something like Shower Spear, is that you, you want to attach it to things that are just obscenely large. Coming from Hammer Time in Modern, uh, the power of Shadow Spear is attacking with 10-10s and 12-12s that could otherwise be chumped, and Shadow Spear is really, really good. Don't get me wrong, attaching Shadow Spear to Al um, to Elmar and attacking with a 4-3 haste tramp lifelink is good, but there's a lot of boards where you just won't do that attack because it's just guaranteed to lose your creature. So I, I, I'm a little sus suspect of it, but I don't think it's a bad call. Going into instance, uh, very easy change. Chaos Warp should be Beast Within. Uh, the 3-3 three, three is better than whatever's on their deck, is my opinion. Uh, and I would play the Chaos Warp as the like fourth of like for example maybe anguished on making could be chaos warp because shuffling into a library is sometimes better than exile and you don't lose the life but anguished on making is really good so i'm tempted maybe uh, assassin's trophy would be the change i'd make but i'm not too sure i think it's close but um i would definitely say generous gift is better than chaos warp looking at our sorceries um as 
you might have guessed, I kind of don't like the ultimatums. This is just a general thing about how I feel about the game, is I find the ultimatums to be not that great. They are really, really restrictive in mana cost, they are really, really flashy, but they are also seven mana. They are very expensive, and a lot of the ramp, even more ramp that I'm gonna suggest, just doesn't cast these spells. So it's they're really clumsy spells, and even then, you know, they don't necessarily win you the game. Ruinous Ultimatum is really, really good in decks that can make the mana quickly and have a ton of pressure. You don't have pressure. Your pressure is the fact that you're building engines that start, you know, negative, like that, that slowly propel you ahead. You don't have often like an immediate attack that defeats all your opponents, which is what Ruinous Ultimatum is really good at. Because otherwise, you cast Ruin as Ultimatum, and you've made a, basically yourself the enemy of all three players, and they're going to go out of their way to defeat you. Likewise, uh, with Eerie Ultimatum, Eerie Ultimatum is really good, but you just don't have the setup that I would really like for this to have. You don't have, you know, Buried Alive, you don't have a combo, as you've said. Uh, this card is just going to kind of be played for value. And yeah, I have mentioned that uh, one of the big threats to your deck is the board is wiped and all of your pieces are in the graveyard, and this will bring them all back. But I don't think you should plan for it, right? This should be this should be something that, you know, you build towards as the best card in your deck, that no matter when you draw it, you're like, oh good, I have it. You know, I can start working towards uh, a lethal eerie ultimatum. And I guess that's my point on both these ultimatums. In this deck, both ultimatums are not lethal casts. And if you told me you're casting a seven mana spell with all colored pips and ultimatum, and you are not then winning the game, I would probably suggest you take those cards out. So that's that's my opinion on both of these. Um, I will also note that both, uh, ruin, especially Ruinous Ultimatum, but both of them are particularly vulnerable to uh, counter magic. Runus Ultimatum, especially because there's a lot of boards where if you board wipe, the blue player will be like, yeah, okay, I'm fine with that. But if you cast Ruinous Ultimatum, that's not a board wipe. That's a one-sided board wipe or, or I don't know how, one-way board wipe. And you're getting rid of their Ristic Studies. You're getting rid of their, you know, their mana artifacts and everything. Even the blue player is like, well, hold on. Let's, let's, talk, let's stop and talk about this. So I would say for sure... Uh, these cards are particularly vulnerable in a deck that is otherwise very resilient. Um, not that I want to cut it, I just want to bring attention to Lich Knight's Conquest is a really, really good card in this deck. I very much so love it here, and it is a card I also thought about from the start. Uh, I think this is just better than Eerie Ultimatum in every single way, because it does it, it works with your deck, and you can use it just to bring back a few creatures without feeling like you've wasted a really powerful spell. Both these cards also make me think about Underworld Cookbook and Asmo. Uh, I haven't suggested those, but I wanted to tell you that they're on my mind, and I think they could be rather good in a deck like this. But I don't know for sure. I think that would require a bit more of a intended reanimation project, uh, project package. And I think with that in mind, it could be really, really good, but it would be a little deck warping. So I'll, I'll let you think about that, but I think it's a cool idea. Rest of our sorceries are good, and let's go into creatures. I also want to go backwards top to bottom because I think a lot of this I like, but there's a few I want to pick on. All right, let's see. Shard of the Void Dragon. Whenever it attacks, each opponent sacrifices, whenever a graveyard. Put two plus one plus one counters I think this is just okay. Um, it's big, it's flashy, it grows, but it's also at that really weird mana cost where, you know, I already like it's already big, right? Its attack trigger is rather good. I do like that, but we need to be able to give it haste to take advantage of it. Otherwise, it's a big flying, you know, destroy me target. Um, and I do like it's interesting, you know synergy with our our deck where it's going to grow incredibly fast i think maybe if you want to play this you need to guarantee you can give it haste right it's just i should click it sorry it's just really close and like 
I, I'd hate for you to cast this and for it to be, you know, swords to plowshares immediately. Because that's what I would do. If I had any means to destroy this card, I would. Even if I'm not going to get attacked by it, because either way, I'm going to be affected by it. So this is this guy has a big target side on him, on him, on him, and you just... I feel like it's too much mana for what he does. I imagine that when he's out and no one stops him, he's incredibly good. But that's kind of the whole thing, right? You're, you need to have been able to grind your opponents out using, like... Like, this is a really good finisher in, like, a discard deck or, like, a, a stacks deck that aims to, like, drain your opponent's, um, you know, their, their, their cards and, and burn through their removal. And then you play this, and then your opponents are all on the back step, and then you can really gain a ton of advantage. But this isn't that deck, right? You're busy setting up your own setup, and because of that, um, you're not in the best kind of situation to take advantage of this. Uh, all right. Just thought of looking at Kogla. I'm going to type the other Kogla to take a look at it on the side. Kogla the Titan Ape. Um, I don't... I guess this synergizes with Warnog. For two mana, you can return Warnog to your hand and get more triggers. I see this every now and then, and I guess I just don't really like it. it Kogla does a lot of things pretty well, but nothing extremely well. Six mana for a removal spell that might die in the progress process isn't great. The fact that if you want to make sure Kogla doesn't die, that six becomes eight mana is rough. The fact that you have to wait for it to attack to destroy an artifact or enchantment, and it only destroys the artifact or enchantment that, um, like that, your that opponent, the one you're attacking, controls, isn't great. All in all, not a big fan. But I will suggest something for a replacement in a second. Uh, Fan Fangren Marauder is a six mana card that whenever artifacts go to the graveyard, you gain five life. This feels like a meta call. And if it's a meta call, I'll let it go. Because if you are playing against a lot of aggressive decks, the amount of life gain you're going to get is very reasonable. And I think it's very much so worth it. However, if there is no meta call on this and this is just a generic card in the deck to do well with your theming i am then considerably less excited about it six mana is a lot of mana and you might say but cursed that's a ton of life imagine you play this and immediately gain like 35 life yeah you know what that's pretty impressive but if you've seen my other videos on life gain and if you've seen my eily video you then you do know that I don't particularly like life gain for life gain's sake. You gain life either to spend it or to use it like landfall triggers, like like triggers on other cards when you gain life. Because if you're sitting across from me and we're playing similarly powered decks, and you play Fangren Marauder, and then you immediately gain let's let's get ridiculous. You gain seventy life. You somehow do a play where you uh, sacrifice treasures and clues in a way that you gain, like you sacrifice 14 artifacts and you gain 70 health. Honestly, I'm not going to be too phased. I'm going to board wipe if I can. I'm going to continue to set up my game plan. And I know eventually I will knock you out of the game. In fact, I also understand that if I board wipe you, you don't really have much to come back from. And I don't really need to pay attention to the fact that you have that much life. It is intimidating to think about getting through 70 life, but if I can keep you down as a player, it's not that it's not that much of a problem. I'll take out the other players and I'll leave you for last kind of thing. So with all that in mind, at the six mana cost, the fact that it's, it's a very clunky creature, I, I don't like this and I'd like it to be taken out. Looking at the rest, the rest generally look rather good. Um, Moriok Rigor also feels just a little too weak for this ability. I do, I do get how this could be really, really good, but it's just, I don't know, it's just really clunky. Yeah, you'll get a really big creature, and, and to be fair, this is the creature that I would have said to attach Shadow Spear to. But even then, it just doesn't feel like it's on the same level as the rest of the deck. Like, the rest of the deck really works with the idea that each of your creatures work, like, they they expand on your engine and they complicate it and they improve it, whereas Moriok Rigor is just kind of benefits when you're doing your thing. It's very kind of win more, and I don't think it's what you need.
Um, the rest look generally good. Glunch the Bestower. What a name. This jellyfish that says you choose... <sighs> You choose three players. First player gets two plus one plus ones. Second player draws a card. Third player creates two treasure tokens. This is a, what do you call it? This is like a group hug card. I just don't know if this belongs here. You have too many cards that equally, uh, you know, improve your opponent's board state. And like, to be honest, I don't think you can afford doing this. Like, I think you take long enough. Like, think about it like this. You, you're playing this deck, I'm playing any deck. I'm playing, uh, I'm playing Hapatra, let's say. You can give yourself two treasure tokens, or you can give me two treasure tokens, or get me to draw a card, or anything like this, right? But let's just talk about the two treasure tokens. Who benefits from the two treasure tokens more? Now you might say, well, Cursed, I do right? My deck builds off of our artifact engines, and getting two treasure tokens lets me continue building my engine. And I go, yeah, 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 that's great. But I'm going to use those two treasure tokens to cast Necropotence, or I'm going to use those two uh, treasure tokens to put in a the last part of my combo a turn earlier, or I'm going to use those two treasure tokens to immediately even just cast Sign and Blood and draw two new cards, right? Um... And the thing is, the difference between those two things is nominal. You're going to use these, uh, you know, these this advantage to continue to build your engine, and I'm going to use it for immediate gratification. And all of a sudden, I'm going to be much further ahead, and then when the turn cycle comes around again, depending on the situation, you might have to give me another, you know, the plus one plus one counters or the draw or the two treasure tokens, you know, you might be like, I'll game it so you get the least powerful one or like maybe you'll be the player that doesn't get one. But the other players will be just as dangerous when you're doing this and you're going to continue to slide behind, right? This is not an even kind of distribution of power. So if you're going to be taking time to kind of build up your engine, you cannot be also propelling your opponents who will who might have just much more straightforward plans. In the long run, like you're going to win. If you can assemble a full engine and just start going off with game objects, you are going to defeat your opponents. But if your opponents are enabled to do their much more straightforward game plans earlier, that might they might not let you get to the point that you're going to have your engine. So these kind of cards don't really they really I really don't find it attractive. The only time they're good is when you're really, really far ahead, and up until then, you're just helping your opponents. So, all in all, uh, I, I really don't like these here. Same thing with Tempting Contract, if we can avoid these. Like, I feel at least Descent into Avernus is damage, and you're getting the treasure at the same time. Jolene is fine because uh, she gives you the, you know, the advantage you get from her is much better than the advantage anyone else gets. So I particularly like that, uh, but Glunch is too close. Glunch, Glunch isn't great. And I think the rest are generally good. Sar, Sar, uh, Sardian Avenger, a card that I'm genuinely, people were really, really impressed with, uh, but is worth very little. I think definitely people need to pick up some copies of. I know this is an answer to things like Glunch and things like Tempting Contract, but I think it's good enough. Like, don't play bad cards to make this good card better, right? This card is already good. Uh, and then the last one that I really want to note is Leon and Elder. I'm going to suggest a different card, but generally, just as mentioned with our big, uh, what was what was our guy's name? Our uh, Marauder. Um, I also don't like the Leon and Elder. The life you gain because it won't trigger anything is kind of meaningless. And this, though, you'll gain a lot of life. Um, in small packets. One, you're going to get annoyed having to do all the triggers, and two, it's just not going to be meaningful. So I'm going to try to suggest something else that works very similarly, because clearly you do like the ability, but uh, with a different kind of ability. Okay. Oh, you're considering one card. Kazul's Fury. Uh, probably don't play this. I don't think you've got anything worth throwing that hard uh, outside of like a really big Moriok uh, rigor. And even then, uh, it's just one target. All right. So let's look at additions that I'd like to make. Well, because I looked it up last, let's let's take a look at Kogla and y Yadaro. Uh, I think this is just much better. 
Um, one, I do believe that it's uh, their discard ability, their, uh, I guess their channel ability, destroy up to one target artifact enchantment, draw a card, and shuffle this back into your deck is really, really good. I do really like it. And the fact that it's, you know, it still has the fight ability when you need it to. Uh, it gets trample and haste if you just want to do damage. I just think it's just really good. So this is just a clear, uh, I would say, a shift between the two of them. It is a bit sad that you can't use it to bounce Wernog, but we'll, we'll do what we can. Speaking of bouncing Wernog, uh, Ephemerate seems really good in this deck. There's not a million targets, but you have enough targets that I think it is worth casting. Uh, the fact that it will count as one of your two casts for uh, Elmar. Is it Elmar? I keep forgetting his name. Yeah, Elmar uh, is really, really good. And if you've ever Ephemerated Wernog, uh, you know the amount of triggers you get. One Ephemerate is two triggers. The second, the rebound, is another two triggers, right? It's just rather, rather good. So you'll be really happy casting this card. Also, if you cast Ephemerate and they destroy their your Wernog in response, you still get a trigger. And to be honest, it's just um, it's just kind of ridiculous. It's it's you're really happy with that exchange if they destroy that. Uh, this is kind of in a random order. So going back to the Leonin R. Uh, whoops, not that one. Leonin um, Elder. Uh, if you really want this ability, I think you should use the Teething Wormlet. Now, this only triggers off of your artifacts as opposed to any artifacts, but as long as there's not another artifact deck on the battlefield, the difference is negligible. You're the one playing the artifacts. You're the one benefiting it from it. And uh, Teethling Wormlet does grow very slowly, but it does grow, which just makes it a little better than the, um, than the Leonin. It also will gain Death Touch even if it's small, which makes it a pretty good blocker. It's also adorable, so that's pretty important too. Um, let me see. I have a few more cards for engines, and then I have a few quote-unquote finishers. Uh, Togo, Goblin Weaponsmith, comes into my view as an interesting card because it is token generation that isn't necessarily one of the three game objects we usually talk about. This creates rock tokens, which are not ideal, but a supply of, you know, free, quote unquote, artifacts that I think your deck can really use. Also, for something that's worth noting, uh, you noted that you don't have a budget. Uh, I know people are usually, when they say that, they mean they're not thinking of everything, but um, if you really don't have a budget, you should get as many fetch lands as you possibly can. Uh, not only are they good with Togo, but uh, you are in five, four colors. Every fetch land is worth the world to you. So try to get those when you can. But Togo, you'll be really, really happy. That's just more into the battlefield triggers. It is technically, you can equip these rocks and throw them. I know that they're not really impressive, but they do sometimes make a difference. Um, but I think generally you'll be happy about getting more tokens into play. Let's see. Another, another card that I was surprised wasn't in here is Paragon Took. Peregrine Took, uh, especially in modern right now, is an immensely powerful card. And so when you have Peregrine Took, it combos with almost all of your deck with just generating an additional food every time you make a token, but also beyond that gives you a draw engine to further get through your deck. Likewise, the card that works really well with Peregrine Took right now is Knight of Sweets Revenge, a card that I think desperately needs to be in here because it starts turning your foods, which is a type of token you have quite a bit of, into mana rocks. And I think that's rather good. Four mana to make an immediate mana rock that you can tap, plus any other food you already have, you're going to be very, very happy with this card. Very, very strong. And it is itself a uh, win condition, where you can tap seven, sacrifice it, and attack for lethal against certain opponents. It'll be very much so a strong card. Uh, another engine card is Unwinding Clock. I think this definitely needs to be in here where it just lets you untap all, all your artifacts, which will work well with, this is kind of like an in-between combo piece. It just makes a lot of your cards better it's kind of win more, it's not necessarily win more, but it does let you tap, uh, untap all your mana artifacts, lets you cast more spells on other people's turns, 
but it also works really well with other other abilities, uh, which we're going to get to in a second as finishers. Uh, Quick Silver, Quick Smith Genius is also something that I particularly like. Uh, I think this is fine. You don't have to play this, but the idea is that it turns all your artifacts into looting, which is rather strong. Uh, this one's not as exciting, but is straightforwardly very good. And finally, uh, the last thing for engines is Zerda. Zerda is really, really interesting because Zerda has a very wide net that you can throw, uh, throw over a lot of things to make them better, right? Obviously, there's some cards that just combo with him or them for infinite mana. We're not going to worry about that. The main thing that I would like you to note is that it turns your clues and your foods from being two mana to one mana. And I'm going to tell you right now, a one mana clue is really, really good. The difference is staggering. The ability to have three open mana and draw three cards instead of drawing a single card is really, really big. You will t occasionally use Zerda's ability, especially when other people are attacking each other. But honestly, if you play this and you can just start cracking clues with a lot lower of a downside. Really, really good. I definitely would suggest it he er, them here. Unfortunately, they cannot be a commander a companion here, but uh, just a really, really strong card. All right, I have two finishers that I wanted to use that are both very much so in theme with what you're doing. The first one is Reckless Fire Weaver. It says whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, Reckless Fire Weaver deals one damage to each opponent. Do not underestimate how strong this card is. This card is really, really strong. The amount of damage you're just going to uh, just cause is stupidly high, considering almost all of your engine cards create tokens that once you have this out, you can easily start be, uh, dealing two to three damage to each opponent per turn cycle. And if you multiply that by three, that's six to nine damage that this card is doing per turn cycle, which is really, really impressive. It also blocks pretty well for what it's worth, but it's also an easy card that you can throw out uh, on turn two and then play Wurnog on the thir third turn. And it does really change, you know, the situation going around. There's also a really fun thing you can do with Wardog and Re uh, Reckless Fireweaver, which I've done before, where you play Reckless Fireweaver and you play Wardog. And you're going to start going, okay, I'll just take the damage. And then you say, hold on. Because of the way Reckless Fireweaver works, either you take the damage and you don't get the clue token, or you take the damage and get a clue token right because the artifact comes into play and you get uh, you get uh, you i gain one two and deal one damage with reckless fire weaver so either it's the same way but you tell them if you take the clue token the damage you would have taken your opponents also take every time you you let me have a clue token, your other two opponents will also take an additional damage. It won't always work. Some people will realize that math heavily skews in your favor, but it's something worth noting. It does for other aggressive decks, that's a deal they might take. And for especially spiteful players, that is a deal they'll take for sure. Reckless Fire Weaver is really, really good. And I would very much so recommend, if nothing else, put this card into your deck. Finally, one more win condition that's a lot more fun is Garapur Aether Grid. Garapur Aether Grid is a very, very strong card, especially in a deck like this, especially with a number of different combos, um, but it is a slow card. Now, this card does combo in certain ways with un uh, Unwinding Clock, but not in a way that instantly wins. It's not an infinite combo. It is just a combo that lets you just deal damage over time in a very regulated way, right? Every two artifacts is one damage now. And when you have that around, not only are you now using all of those artifacts that are just laying off to the side, the food tokens, the clue tokens that you can't crack because you don't have the mana, those are now dealing damage, but it's important to note that these this also damages creatures, right? This is creature removal. It's expensive in terms of the number of artifacts you have to tap, but it is still rather, rather good. So you play this, and then you just start doing some pinging at the end of your last opponent's upkeep. 
And as you're bored, as you're playing the game naturally, your artifacts are going to grow and therefore, you know, you get to keep doing this. And the thing I really like about Gurupur Ether Grid here is the fact that it is board wipe immune. Well, traditional board wipe immune. They'll destroy all your creatures, they'll destroy your engines, but Gurupur Aether Grid and all of the food and all of the clue tokens that you've made are still on the battlefield and you can still take advantage of them. And I do really, really rather like that. And I think it's really, really good here. And I think that's generally going to be my suggestions for the deck. I think the deck is really, really good. I, I really like the direction it's going. Adding green, because mine was Mardu, uh, has a lot of fun inclusions, especially with like all the Pippins and Marys are very, very good here. And yeah, I really, really do like the direction of the deck. I've tried to suggest anything that doesn't like immediately win the game, because that's not the fun of a deck like this. And my general suggestions are to, you know, Cut some of the higher mana cards that don't really work in in uh, tandem with the rest of it. You know, be on the lookout of cards like Tempting Contract and uh, Glunch that very much so benefit your opponents far more than they benefit you. And um, and get fetch lands if you can. Please get fetch lands. I would be so so happy. And then for additions, if you're taking anything, for sure start with getting. Uh, Reckless Fireweaver, Garapur Aether Grid, after which Zerda is really, really nice, Unwinding Clock's really nice, Paragon is really nice, Knight of Sweeps Revenge is really nice, and then up to you on the rest. I think Kogla is a very clean uh, switch one Kogla for another. That would be the direction I would go into. Um, I think the deck itself is obviously very fun and very powerful. Uh, play with that a bit, see how you feel about win conditions. And then if you feel like you still need something a little more concrete, we can take another look. Because uh, as much as players tend to shy away from like infinite combos or like one win, like instant win combos, uh, they're nice to have. They do end games. And my favorite part of a magic game is when it's over because then you get to shuffle up and start a new one. I hope this deck assist video was helpful to you. If you'd like to send me another draft of this deck or any deck, there is a link in the video description down below. And if you would like, you know, to make your deck list that you send me the next deck I work on, there's a link for that as well. If you could like, comment, subscribe, I would be very, very grateful. The channel is always growing and it means a lot. And um, I really hope to see more of this deck. I love Friends Forever Partners and Warnog and Elmar are a very good combination. Uh, there's a lot of different combinations of the Friends Forever that I do really, really like, and I think you should try them all out if you have the means, because they're very, very fun. All right. Thank you so much for the deck, and good luck.